Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, office hour in, uh, in September, right? So, and today, super excited to have Taylor here, who is our genius um, behind the scene for the Watson Project. Um, it's, 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 it's an honor to have him here to kind of walk us through all the behind the scene, all the deep dives, all the things that you want to learn about how Watson works with Red Panda. And, you know, super excited to, for him to be here. I'm going to hand this over to him and let him introduce himself a little bit and we can get started with this office hour. And by the way, this session is recorded. We'll be um, taping this and we'll put this on YouTube channel um, in a week or so. Well, cool. thanks, Christina. I'm pumped to be here uh, as well. Uh, yeah, it's great. So um, yeah, my name is Tyler Rockwood. I'm a uh, software developer on the core team at, at, um, here at Red Panda. The core team is the team that develops the main C++ binary um, that it delivers our, our product. And I'm the tech lead for our um, yeah tr data transforms that are powered by WebAssembly. So uh, it's a, been a, yeah, sort of an, an Resurgence of a project recently, but I've, I'm a, relatively new to the team. I've been here at Red Panda for about six months. Um, before this, I worked, yeah, in a couple. Of, I worked at a startup, and then I worked at Google and storage for a while. So, um, yeah, it's fun. I love hacking on VMs and distributed systems and databases and all those things are right up my alley. So, yeah, it's been a. This has been an absolute blast project. I'm excited to share some of the fun details and things here. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, so for everybody that's here, um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, you can um, go on camera, you can talk. This is not limited. Feel free to kind of shout your questions or shout your comments. Let us know. And we would love to hear your feedback as well. You know, if you see something that's wrong or anything you want to be answered, just like type it or, you know, just let us know. Um, I'm going to quick quickly start with like the very basic questions, you know, just to set the ground for people that doesn't really know uh, what is Watson and how everything works. Can you just quick, really quickly tell us like, what is Wasm anyway? <laughs> yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, so yeah, so Wasm stands for, stands for WebAssembly. Uh, it's just really cool technology that's kind of taken off recently that started in the browser as a way to sort of run uh, programs that aren't written in JavaScript. Um, so there are, there's lots of like image processing tasks or like, I know, for example, like Figma has written like a whole browser within the browser using WebAssembly. Like it's really cool stuff you can do in the, um, in the browser to do all this. And what we've seen, you know, and what we're doing here in Red Panda as well is we're saying, oh, this is a great thing. It can also be run in a data center, uh, not just in a browser. So it's a great, uh, it, it's a VM in a, in a uh, bytecode format that a lot of languages compile down to that you can then run sort of anywhere. It gives a lot of great uh, sandboxed execution so you can control very tightly the CPU and memory usage and all of these things, which are very important for us uh, at Red Panda with our you know thread per core architecture and, and our very opinionated through approach to memory management and some of these things that let us squeeze all of the performance we can out of the hardware. Um, we need these sorts of controls in the VM as well that's running. So when we're executing, you know, your code or anybody's code, um, we can we can make sure that we're still able to do all the other stuff that the broker needs to do at a really high performance. Um, so there's a, a lot of a, the appeal about WebAssembly. Also with the, just the ergonomics of sort of you can write in whatever language you want. Um, if you're a Python person, you know, someday we'll have a Python SDK. If you want to write stuff in grain laying or whatever these languages if you if it compiles down to WebAssembly, we can run it um yeah so i think those are the like key tenets that make web WebAssembly like the right thing um yeah, yeah so you could eat over but here. you made it sound more like a uh a virtual machine right and i've seen like some talks that people were saying hey this is probably like the new docker or the new environment to run your um your your code your piece of code right but I mean, like the VM doesn't have the best reputations in the world out there. I mean, I heard a lot of bad things about different VMs and how they handle memories and like resources. What is the difference between like the Watson VMs and like um, and the the traditional one that we've seen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like for yeah, so there's like VMs are great. I was a JVM developer like in a past life and have done a lot um, with the Java virtual machines. So and there's other you know VMs out there as well that are they're they're great. I think there's um you know with a VM you there's a lot of great things about like I said controlling having uh like a lot of guarantees about things are, that you run inside the VM are safe. Um, and things like that. I think 
you know, there, there's, there is an overhead to doing those sorts of things and having those controls. And I think that's where, from a performance perspective, maybe isn't the greatest thing. The nice thing about Wasm as a VM is it's very, very lightweight. Um, for example, you can, the smallest VM you can have is like, like I have ran real programs that have just used like 64 kilobytes of memory to run up a whole VM. Um, and plus a little bit extra for the executable memory. We'll talk about some of the VM under the hood stuff a little bit later, but uh, I'm sure, but, um, you, they're very lightweight and very small and they're very, very fast. The bytecode format is like almost a one-to-one -one mapping. So, uh, if you're not familiar with VMs, the sort of, there's an instruction set, which is sort of tells the virtual machine what you need to do. And the Wasm bytecode is almost maps directly to like hardware instructions, but is at the same time is safe, uh, to run in terms of, um, they don't give direct access to the stack. So it prevents a lot of sort of like um, malicious attacks and security vectors. It was divine, designed very like upfront with security being in mind. And most VMs probably weren't run, weren't designed to be run in a web browser, I would say. Um, so the fact that it's lightweight and um, it's also meant to be embedded into an application as well. So things like if you've run a Lua VM or heard of Lua, Lua is a great language that's designed to be uh, built into like embedded in applications as an extension point. And Wasm is another one of those. Whereas, you know, more heavier weight, like a JVM, you're not running like multiple JVMs on a single node usually, right? And these are very heavyweight instances. They spin up lots of threads and do all these things. And where Wasm is very lightweight, like I've ran some benchmarks and things recently where I have thousands of these VMs running like on a single node, um, which is like a really cool thing that you would never do with like other sorts of VMs, right? Like the fact that it's so lightweight. So I think those are some of the like key things um, that make like what the Wasm VM like really cool. Uh, and the so fact that it's just like a compilation target for like all of these different languages is awesome as well. That is pretty cool because I, I feel like it's more like a, a, a package of softwares and isolations of their resource and how you can put, um, kind of put them all together. And now it's more lightweight compared to like the traditional OVMs. That, am I I'm understanding it right? And I, th I think it's fascinating on how you can translate um, different languages because obviously they were handled differently. Um, like, you know, Java is probably very different from running a piece of like C code or, or Go, lang Go lang code, right? So I think that's like, really fascinating and see how that turns into like something that's executable in such a small thing so that's really really cool yeah Super. and then like so what so okay so from my perspective that's a vm that's running so why did you put wasm and like red panda together right like why you put why do you want to put them together like how do yeah. they work like that's a great question i have a couple <laughs> diagrams to help me explain this all right um, i'll the sharing um so anyway so traditionally um so it's taking a step back from wasm traditionally we'll, we'll talk about stream processing so R red panda is a super high powered efficient fast um uh message broker where you can put stream messages in and out and let's say you want to do something really simple we have this great blog post that talks about taking uh standing up uh, an apache flink cluster to take these uh, JSON events that are coming in. That's like a click stream for your ad or whatever, you know, whatever it is, taking it in and then transforming them into Avro for like a different part of your system wants to read them in as Avro. So like this is sort of the, the mental model is you have Red Panda. That's like your message broker that, you know, takes all these events and routes them in the right place, gives them to the, to the consumers, et cetera. And then you spin up this other different like distributed system just to do this really simple thing of transcoding this JSON into Avro. So the hope and goal of Wasm is that these, a lot of these, in a lot of these cases where you want to do these transformations are these like simple stateless, like single message transforms where you take one message, you do something, mangle the format, you remove some, you know, PII data so a different part of the company can see this or whatever it is, like they're very simple things that people want to do. And yet they have to wrestle the complexity of standing up this whole separate like distributed system and infrastructure just to do this really simple thing of like JSON to Avro. Um, so the goal with, uh, let me see, there you go, with WebAssembly is that we can do this just in the broker for you. And you can do this ergonomically from any language that you're comfortable with. So if you want to, if you're a Rust developer, if you're a Go developer, whatever it is, Java, Python, like all, all these languages will either currently support like going down to WebAssembly or will soon. And um, yeah, we can just do these really simple transformations inside the broker directly. And we can do, there's some nice advantages of this. One, it's less stuff for you to manage and need to spin up and, and learn. 
Um, two is that it's, um, we, we can do some better, like, uh, performance things in terms of latency, right? Like we, for example, if your input and output top partitions are on the same node, we can just write them without going through any network interfaces, skip all the ping pong your data all over the place just to do these simple things, um, which is great. Um, so I think that's the main key advantage of like, can we, and we see a lot of these streaming use cases to be a lot of this, like. I have this legacy system that's spitting in like JSON in this weird format. And I want to normalize it to what the rest of, you know, the applications that are producing look like. So that's sort of the general premise of like Red Panda streaming and where WebAssembly fits into that. I think this is great because when I go to a customer site, right, when I look at their data pipelines, I see most of them doing stateless um transformations, right? Most of the, their data pipelines doing one single thing because they want it to be scaled out. So they would tend to kind of do this like simple transformation. And that takes a lot of their, like, you know, a lot of their work to get it out and getting in, into another data source, right? Data store, right? So I think this is going to help a lot from yeah. if, if, yeah. if it promised to do that, right? So from yeah. the developer's perspective, this is great. But then how do I get my web assembly into Red Panda? How, how do I do that? Is there any tools that I need to install and how do I do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I do want to caveat that like, uh, I'm not bashing Apache Flink by any sense of the means. Like there are some things like the state, stateful transforms where you want to like do windowing or aggregations or like those things for now are better suited for Flink. And hopefully someday more of these simple use cases we can do in WebAssembly. But yeah, as you get to actually developing these WebAssembly transforms, um, sort of sticking with our principles at Red Panda is like, you'll need one tool. You just need RPK and you can sort of do all of your development. I mean, obviously outside you're still gonna need, you know, VS Code or Vim or whatever you use to write code in and, you know, whatever tool chain for your language. But the goal is you just use RPK. We'll have a nice command line experience where you can initialize a project sort of if you're, uh, I have a, some node background and like in uh, if you've used like NPM at all to like create a package, you can just NPM create or whatever it is. Uh, sort of like similar vibes of like, initialize a little project for you and you just have like one little function that you basically if you've ever written like a lambda or you know fu a function from like gcp or Vercel or whatever it is like you just want to write a little like serverless function that that runs in and out you can do this with um with 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 rpk and you just get a little go go snippet for now and and you can you know code up your little transform to do that trend to do that your whatever your logic is and then um the same thing with rpk you can rpk transform build and it will take that your go code and it will compile it down to web assembly um right now we're using a uh, a compiler for go so right now sorry it's, it's we're using uh tiny go or go as the main language uh, we want to support more languages and we will in the future but we're trying to really nail down this first use case of developer experience and starting with one language um, but yeah, we're using a, a alternative compiler for Go called TinyGo, which is a subset of Go that runs faster and also supports WebAssembly. Um, and uh, the yeah, I'll talk more about that as we go on. But basically, we will manage that tool chain for you. So you can just RPK transform build. It'll compile your Go code into Wasm. And then another command, RPK transform deploy. And it will take your Wasm, package it up along with a little bit of metadata that you specify, and it will deploy it to the broker. And then the broker from there will take that WebAssembly and your metadata of, you know, which topics you're writing and reading from, and we'll manage that and make sure it's running and, um, yeah, and a nice seamless, easy, you know, three-step command sort of experience as well. Um, and there's other, like, cool things I think we want to do here as well in the future of, like, having a registry of, like, pre-built functions for you. Um, there's another team within the company that's been starting to build some example programs of like common things that we see people do. You know, for example, if you want to do transcoding from JSON to Avro, we can have like a pre-built Wasm transform built for you. And you just basically configure it with, you know, whatever topics you want to write with. And you can add some environment variables to, you know, change the runtime behavior and then deploy that to your broker. And you don't even have to write any code, um, which is pretty, pretty awesome as well. So you get to choose and pick and choose which one you want to actually deploy in the broker. That's pretty cool.
but from the developer's perspective, because everything is is a WhatsApp app, right? So is there any particular particular ways that we need to kind of think about or any ways that we need to write in order to fit into this um, WhatsApp type of coding style? Is there anything that we need to, so in order to get it more efficient and, and, and be able to compile within the WhatsApp engine? Is there? Yeah, any- yeah, that's a great question. So I think twofold answers. One is there's a standard known as WASI. Um, which is a standard for embedding WebAssembly into a like L- POSIX-like environment. So basically you can have a lot of the familiar things like standard in, standard out, environment variables, clocks, like all these things that you're sort of used to interacting with uh, that are like the, uh, an operating system provides from you. There's a standard that a lot of these languages compiled when they compile to WebAssembly. That's sort of like, if you think of it from a, you know, compiler perspective, there's an architecture, which is like whether you're running on, you know, ARM64 or x86-64, whatever it is, um, like WebAssembly is sort of the architecture. It's the byte code format that you write to. But then there's the other side of things of like whether you're running on Linux or Windows or the operating system, right? And one of those operating systems, so to speak, for WebAssembly is, is WASI. And it gives this like set of standardized calls to be able to, you know, interact with file systems, sockets, and all these sorts of things. Um, so this is great for us because one, we can give a lot of, you know, control and constraints over these things. Um, one, one example, but, but, the, but also like you get a full, full ecosystem of like all your standard tools and things, um, should work. So you don't have to really like change your mental model too much. Um, well, there are a couple of caveats right now though. One of which is, um, if you want to like write to disk right now, we, we disallow any system calls that would end up being turning into like disk read and write because these transforms can kind of like be moved around arbitrarily at any time as, you know, we'll rebalance your cluster and things like that to move your partitions uh, for better load balancing and things. And we'll move your transforms with them today as well. So, um, you know, if you write a lot to disk, you then slow that process down of like moving your transform because now you have to transform all that, move all that stuff from to another disk and it's more complicated. So right now we don't provide any disk access. Um, and uh, in the future, we, we we may provide some like key value stores or simpler things, but that's sort of like initially where we're landing. And then also with like network support, um, one is the WASI standard is still sort of figuring out the story around like networking and it's a little incomplete there. But two, we don't provide network access at the moment just because um, there's a lot of like resource consumption things you have to start thinking about of number of open sockets, right? If you're running a cluster with 10,000 partitions on a node, for example, and you and each each of those is running a, a WebAssembly VM and they all open up a connection right to the internet, then you're like running out of ports very quickly, um, for example. So um, there are some like things we've constrained for now as we sort of like figure out the technology and the experience of things. But for the most part, you can do any sort of normal thing that you would want, reading from clocks and environment variables and those sorts of things. Um, but there's a few limitations in like disk and network. We don't yet allow much outside access. Cause again, we're focusing on these stateless transforms that don't need interaction from anybody else. So that they scale very well. Right. So basically we, we need to kind of stay away from storing temporary data or permanent data, like into anywhere, right? Because it's doing stateless transformations anyway, and then maybe making another ex- external connection because that kind of contradicts what we're trying to do, which is like limiting like read and writes within this within the same machine, but then you're opening up another socket, which is kind of why we're doing that. If you're doing that, just stream it out to another data pipeline, whatever, right? Yeah, I yeah. Think that makes sense, right? Yeah. I mean, in the future, like I, there's, we see a lot of use cases for people who want to like, you know, take some data from a database of like credit scores or whatever it is and like do some enrichment sort of things. We see this as a key use case and we'd like to support it in the future because um, while we can't write things to disk, you can still cache things in memory. And I think that's a great idea, especially in languages that have like VMs and, or that have garbage collection and stuff built into them. It's nice to sort of say like, I'm always going to need some of this memory every time a record comes in. So let's just save it in a like global variable or something. And you can initialize it at startup. Um, we do this in our, we have a sort of SDK that sort of wraps the interface between which we talk to the broker with. Um, there's a lot of cool details in there, but this SDK gives you like that really simple, like, I just want to write a function that takes a record in and spits out another record. Um, and it handles everything else that's happening sort of behind the scenes. And mm-hmm. Um, we do some nice like caching and things of that in memory um, that like when we start up the VM, we'll allocate some like 
you know, a kilobyte or whatever it is, however big your records generally are, will generate some amount of memory and keep that around so that you don't have to work. The GC doesn't have to touch, touch that or think about it. Just sort of, we use that buffer to fill up all the bytes from the, from the uh, broker to pull them into the VM and then the VM does its transfer and then we, you know, pull them back out. So um, yeah, there's some cool stuff like that. So like at least SDK like um re recorded somewhere because current currently when we're trying out the new um like the new template only gives us like a few things that we can write. Are there any other things we can work with um that is available on documentations that we can kind of use and kind of try out? Yeah, so um I guess if you're talking about the 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 documentation for that will be hosted because right now it's just a Go SDK is the only one we've built okay. out. Um, and that'll be, that's, that documentation will be both on, in the red panda docs and in the traditional, like go packages, modules. If you ah, okay. use the normal go like documentation, it'll be there as well. Um, but, um, yeah, that's sort of the, the, the main two places, um, where, where some of that will be. Okay. So I think you just hinted a little bit on how the VMs were running. So I'm just kind of curious, right? So when the WASM application was, was, was arrived in the broker itself, what what how does it work internally within the Red Panda broker Red or well, Red Panda node? Because you know, because Watson process is going to take up some like resource, it's going to take up some space. Will they be fighting for these type of memories? And you know, like all oh, because those limited, it's, it's a very limited environment. Well, it's you gotta have you have like pre-existing CPUs and memory. So how does it look? Is um can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I can kind of like sketch out the sort of like general architecture of how this is built. And then we can dive into maybe some of the like more resource and like operational sort of like thing, right. concerns and things. So yeah, to start with the architecture, basically the the idea is within Red and, Panda. And sorry, it's distributed as well, right? So oh you, yeah, yeah. It's distributed. It'll run on a full cluster and right. um, so uh yeah basically the idea is you'll have um within red panda there's this single raft group that runs on every node that's um that is called the controller that manages sort of all this the cluster information of what partitions run on what nodes and does scheduling and things like that so one other th part about the the scheduler is now it's been extended to control like wasm transforms and it keeps it around some metadata about all the transforms that run. So basically on every core, everything within Red Panda is sharded per core. So like on every core, we'll keep track of what transformations exist in the cluster and what ones, um, and sort of the, a little bit of metadata about them, like the inputs and outputs. And then uh, in, in terms of the topics, and if, if that core becomes leader for the input um, partition, so you can think all these transforms now take one input topic and map to one output topic and that input to output topic um, transform, we run all of these VMs on the input topic, on the same core as the input topic. Um, and I think down the road, we'll have some advantages and be able to do fancier sort of scheduling. Like maybe it makes sense to run it on the output topic um, scheduling. Maybe it makes sense to schedule this on a different node or or we can kind of play with it now. But for now, we, we schedule all these with the input um, partition and we'll spin that up and read that. So we can read that really quickly locally um and we will so so each core is responsible yeah like i said it has a list of all the transforms that should be running when it sees it becomes leader of a given partition on the input topic it will then spin up one of these vms um it'll make sure that and it will go fetch the executable we store the executable inside an internal topic um within red panda and then we can go like fetch that very very quickly so we we get the wasm binary and then what we do is we'll run it through um the VM to then compile that into machine code. So it takes that WASM bytecode and it turns that into machine code that can run on the X64 or, you know, ARM64 or whatever hardware you're running on. It'll run, compile that code down to the actual hardware. And then once it's done that, um, it'll cache that sort of like on a per node basis because that has a resource of executable memory. Because basically what happens is you take that, you know, the, that bytes we've loaded, we parse it out, and then we write it into executable memory, uh, which is a special set of memory um, that can then like actually go and like run, can be executed. Normal memory doesn't have these permissions. You have to run some special sys calls to be able to mark various different memory uh, locations as executable. So 
we have a small pool of memory that we'll set aside for that'll be one tunable is like how much executable do you memory do you need for all of your transforms and we'll have some stats and things to so you can kind of deploy something even to like a dev cluster and see oh okay this transform that i just built um is like a you know half a half a megabyte wasm application that i've just built and when it's compiled down to machine code it needs you know, three quarters of a megabyte or something of executable memory. So you just need to budget that into your like normal memory resource limits. So anyway, that's that's also cached like on a per node basis um, because the executable memory can be used for all the different cores that are running. Um, and then each core will spin up its own VM and interact with it um, and actually like run those, that C, those CPU instructions that have been generated. Um, so that's sort of the general like high level working model. And then those... Once it take it reads from that local um, partition, and then transforms these into the VM, and then it will either and then it writes it out to the output, and that output may be on the same like core on that same machine, which then it can do a really efficient write, or maybe it has to hop over to a different core to do that sort of write, which it can do, or it may be on a different node, which then we have some internal RPCs that are really efficient that we'll use to like make re these requests um, to these other nodes within the cluster to write out those records as they've been written. But that's sort of like the general high level architecture of like how things run and where things are. I see. So so basically, once the streaming data hits into the broker, it's going to execute that executable um, set of code and then having to kind of distribute the, the output data into either same core, different core or different partition in different nodes. It's basically that's what it does, right? So yeah. I assume it's not going to fight for too much of the core resources because it's just going to quickly take the take the data process it and then just take and then send it out right so this yeah is so yeah that's part of the the goal of having it compiled down to direct machine code from the byte code so there's different ways you can run wasm there's really three i would say three main ways there's um like an interpreter that just kind of like walks over the byte code and executes the instructions and then there's just in time compilation which compiles it um, in memory, writes it to this executable space and then runs the ex the like directly translated machine code. And then there's ahead of time compilation, which you'd take something heavyweight like Clang or mm -hmm. uh, GCC or the like, and that will run a bunch of optimizations over the, the generated machine code to be as efficient as possible. And then you sort of take that compiled artifact and that's what you send around into different places. So we've sort of chosen that middle road in terms of that spectrum of you know, the the uh, interpreter is really fast at starting up because there's no like pre-compilation needed, but then it's a little bit slower because those there's this translation on the fly sort of into the actual machine instructions. Whereas uh, the just-in-time sort of has the flexibility of, of both, but without the cost. So one of the downsides of the ahead of time compiled, which is the maximal performance way, which would be nice, mm -hmm. is that then the thing that you're storing and keeping around is like, executable machine code which one has some security implications right like it's it becomes easier to inject that into places or have those sorts of things whether if it's done on the fly you can sort of have better guarantees over the safety of that um and and two in terms of like if you have a cluster that has like you know some nodes are arm and some nodes are use intel cpus then like now you have to store both versions of it or if say you run an intel uh, cluster and then you're like oh I want to move over to arm because you know I, these new graviton instances are awesome and have a little better cost efficiency you now have to like recompile your wasm or something like that so that's the advantage of this sort of like JIT compilers just in time compilers or compile these things just in time as they're needed um, so that's sort of where we landed in the compiler space and um, yeah sorry I think what was your can you go back to your question I've got no, no, don't worry about it um, so and Sorry, there was a question. Can you, there's a question from, can you explain with some case study or some analogy to explain why we need Watson with Riffin? So I think you already did. Um, um, so we'll probably go back to that question a little bit. I just saw that question popping up. So yeah, just... yeah, we can go back. I have a different slide from our blog post that sort of um, uh, somebody put together on the initial transform. So let me share this real quick. Okay, I think people can see this. Uh, cool. So this is sort of a traditional setup for um, writing in, um, sorry. So this is a sort of a traditional setup for streaming data. You have all your upstream systems. 
and you sort of write that into the your your messaging infrastructure, which will ingest and save and store these, and then they can be read from at different times to these downstream applications, right? And if you want to do any sort of change to that data that these downstream applications see, you sort of put it through the separate stream processing uh, infrastructure that will consume this, do a transform, and then produce it back out. So let's to give like a very concrete. I think example that's that's we see used for being very common is if you're a big company, let's say you're a big like e-commerce company and you want all your transactions to go through so that like you have one sub one downstream system that does like anomaly detection to make sure there's no fraud or any weird scams going on. You have another thing that wants to like record all the purchases that happen on a per person basis so you can provide better recommendations in your app. And then, you know, you can think of a few other examples for that sort of like transaction data as things are being bought in your e-commerce app. Right. But let's say like you don't want to give people's like in that record is like credit card information for the, for the fraud detection system. Right. Cause they need to, they need that information to do their job. Right. But you don't necessarily want the team that's doing like recommendations to have all that, that, you know, those credit card numbers. Right. So one thing that you can do is, you know, spin up this whole separate infrastructure that will take that data as it comes in all those e-commerce like purchase events, strip out the that that little bit of information and put it back in so that then they can consume from uh from Red Panda this this information, you know, as they need it. But it's it's secure and you don't have to worry about leaking, you know, these sort of like concerns with GDPR and all these security and and uh uh privacy sorts of things. Um, but you have to spin up this whole separate cluster to do this, right? And you have to learn this other, like, there, there. I, I was reading or listening to something recently that, like, if you're using Apache Flink, there's like a six month developer ramp up time or something like that to really understand all the details of that thing, which just shows. I think just whether it's actually that long or not, I don't know, but it just shows you the sort of the depth of complexity of some of these systems, and like in that case, you're doing a really simple thing. You're just taking one JSON field and you're making it an empty string or null or whatever it is. Right. Um, and like, can we do that a lot simpler? And that's where WebAssembly comes in is right. Right. We can do that sort of, as we store it, we can also do a transform and store this other view of the data for these other consumers to get. Um, that's sort of the goal is you eliminate an extra distributed system. You have to stand up. Um, I mean, I'm a little biased, but I think it's a lot simpler to write a, a small WASM transform, a single function than, kind of like learn flink and all the like details there. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the main like idea case study, I, I would say of like, there's one case study, I think um, it's hopefully easy to, to grasp. So to add on top of that, I think Jones has a very good questions about will Watson allow join across multiple topics or window time window based querying um, functions? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think some of this we definitely want to do. I think some of the things for like aggregations over like a window of time in special cases, right, where this is, you know, like say you just want to like sum up the number of events that have happened or something simple, like we could totally do that in Wasm, right? But some of these other more complex things where you're joining like multiple input streams and you want to keep a window of like five minutes of all the events so you can aggregate uh, or in like, comb in like combine events in the right place and things like that is gets very beefy very soon. And like our lean and mean brokers aren't necessarily like the best thing for that. Right. Um, Cause they're handling all the, all this stuff. And sometimes you just need a lot of memory or re CPU to do that. And the broker already has a lot of things that it's already doing. Um, especially because generally red Panda runs very lean, right? That's sort of our, we, we stand on our efficiency. So you can have a very small cluster that can get a very high throughput, but as soon as you start wanting to do all this, like really intensive compute based things, or you need a lot of memory to store, um, all this join information as you're combining the streams, like it, maybe it does make sense to have separate infrastructure for some of these bigger, com more complex things. So yeah, that's sort of the, so we, I think some of the simple cases of simple aggregations and windowing we could potentially do, um, more complex things like joins, probably not We're we're still sort of like figuring out where, uh, we're going to draw the line from process stream processing and Wasm, but there are other other sorts of applications we see for Wasm besides stream processing within Red Panda as well. I agree with you. I think there's a place for different type of pipelines, right? So for, for complex stream processing, window time window based processing where it requires a lot of temporary storages because we're fighting between like one megabytes or two megabytes of like memory right now, and you're talking about like a lot, lot larger memory. So. I think it's definitely like deserves somewhere. And I think Flink is a great solution for that and also allows you to kind of integrate with other data stores as well, right? So 
I agree, kind of agree with you on there. Um, so also Travis has another question. So you mentioned the transform map, maps, one input to L1 output topics. Is that a hard requirement or is it just an example? Yeah, that's a great question. So for now, it is a hard requirement, but we want to very quickly like remove that. One of the things, how it works now is it's, again, this, the, the simplest thing is that it's one-to-one input like from the input topic to output topic, but also in terms of partitions. So they both have to have at least the same number of partitions because all we do is map partition one on the input to partition one on the output, partition two on the input to partition two on the output and sort of vice versa. So we would like to very quickly remove the requirement so you could write to multiple output topics. We see this as like people want to have like a, uh, like a dead letter queue as an example, um, where people have like malformed data that comes through or like some other error that your thing barfs on. You just want to like spit that out to some separate topic for like doing like root cause analysis later. Um, you can, you, we want, so we definitely want to do this very soon, but the current restriction is that one-to-one -one, um, and you need this sort of co-partitioning is usually a term I see thrown around for the same number of partitions on each, but we would like to remove both of those things. Cause there are other cases of like, let's say all of your, you know, in, input data comes in on one topic and you want to like, and there's different forms, right, of that. And you want to take like a tiny subset of that information. Like say it's all the events that happen in your app and you want to take all the logins and like fork it off to a different stream for some other team to like process. It's like you would don't want to like your thousand partition, like big beefy stream to like need a thousand partitions for this little like filter stream. So we want to, we want to lift both of these requirements as soon as we can. So um, I think that'll be a fast follow after we get this out into a real release. All right, looking forward to it. I'd love to see that. Dela Loki was definitely like one of the most asked um, and used one as well, right? So definitely we, we need that. Yeah, <laughs> that it'll be... happen, it'll happen. Yeah, it'll All right, happen. So going, going back to uh, my question before, so because everything was, I was talking about like the resource usage and uh, resource consumption inside the broker. So is there a good ratio because we are actually like, you know, installing and having transformations inside a broker? What's a good ratio of like how many transform can we have inside one broker? Because obviously the more resource we need, we need to kind of have more brokers and it's going to cost us money to actually have another broker running. So is there a good ratio that you recommend for these type of things? Yeah, I think it, it's hard to tell because you need to know like what the transform is doing, right? Some transforms are super cheap and you can maybe have lots of them. Um, some of them are maybe more expensive um, and you maybe need to have like more more memory or things. I think ultimately it'll be a cost of like, as long as it fits within the model of what we're defining, it'll just be, you know, what is this? You may have to have a little bit beefier broker maybe or add an extra node or something like that just to sort of distribute these things a little more. It's hard. It's going to be hard to give like exact concrete numbers on things. I think the two main things, uh, resources is again, just memory and CPU. Um, we'll have pretty well-defined, uh, limits on memory because we'll sort of have a pool of memory that these VMs can pull from. Um, and you can sort of configure what that value is, um, for your use cases and how many transforms you want to have. And then the, the nice thing about CPU is example, that's a little bit more dynamic of a resource because we can do fancy things like suspend the VM. So say you have like you have a really low input stream that like takes in like just a few messages every minute that you want to want maybe a little more expensive computation on whatever that may be. Um, but, but with our sort of thread per core design is like if a, if a single like task inside of a, a core runs for, you know, let's say it needs to run for a second, right? which isn't that long of a, of a computation, but let's say something needs to run for a second. That means there's a whole second if it just runs that nothing else can happen on that core. So if that core is handled for network, like client traffic, all that gets paused or whatever, right? And you don't really want that to happen. So the, that's one of the nice things about WebAssembly as well is what we can do is it can get partway through a computation and we can suspend the VM, tell the VM to like, pause execution, and then we can switch into other important IO work. So we may break up that long, you know, one second uh, computation into like a bunch of 20 millisecond chunks spread throughout a, a little bit longer. So it does mean that you get a, a latency goes up a little bit, but you get better full throughput of things because the broker is able to do other things. It's also nice from an operational perspective. If you accidentally like throw in an infinite loop into one of your, or have some weird edge case where there's a bug and you just loop forever, then that doesn't like just eat up a whole core, you know, and if, and likely this is, you know, running on a bunch of cores. So it doesn't just like pause and lock up your whole broker, right? Um, so those are some of the challenges that we, you know, we, one of the key things for Wasm and also one of the challenges for us as we are integrating this cool technology is like make sure that, you know, it works well with our thread per core design. 
So, um, so that brings up another question, right? Because you talk about all this, and is there any way that I can see things happening? What about observabilities, right? Like, how do I see things, and how do I know? Like, some function is like running infinite loops. Like, one core is just all taken up all my resource. Like, how do I see that? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, one, our existing like Prometheus metrics will have lots of metrics all broken down per function. So you'll be able to see. This function is you have has this much CPU utilization. This function has this much input output bandwidth. This function has this many um, like transforms in a you know error state, for example. Because if a transform fails, we'll kind of like retry with back offs. But if you're in that state where it's down and we're waiting to retry, we we can you know we'll have some metrics so you know this is happening, right? So you can hook up existing alerts into whatever is reading from Prometheus or whatever it may be. So that's one way of getting the normal sort of observability. Another is all the um, we, we talked a little bit about logging, I think, before we sort of hit record. But um, all the the nice thing about WASI is that it gives you that POSIX like environment. And one of the things it gives you is standard out and standard air. So you can write standard out and standard air within your VM. And that goes to the broker logs as info and warning levels. And then you can sort of, if you have access to those broker logs, you can sort of filter out the logs for the transform subsystem. And then you can kind of see, oh, okay, here's all my like transform logs. So if you want to see some logging and then additionally within RPK itself, you'll have some nice commands to like view, you'll say like RPK transform list and it will list all your all your transforms, it'll tell you sort of information about inputs and outputs and also like how many are, are in a like, you know, good status or not good status. You know, you have 10 out of 10 running or you'll have nine out of 10 running because one hit a weird edge case that blew up or whatever um, may happen. So that, those are sorts of some of the, like, I think key operational things, but we'll have stats. I mean, I think the, the biggest thing that we'll cover a lot about is just the Prometheus metrics, which will have stats for U CPU utilization, how much memory each VM is using or um, and then like the, yeah, the throughput and then what state they're in and all sorts of like things like that. That's super cool. Um, so one, I think one, I really want to ask this question. I mean, we only have like two minutes left, but feel free to stay. Cause I want to, I don't know, kind of ask all the questions I want to know, cause I'm curious. Um, so when you were developing this, um, like, um, features, right. What is the hardest, what's the biggest challenge when you were like developing this, um, awesome project What's the yeah one? that's a great question i think there were there were two challenges the initial one was trying to like just pick which vm implementation which runtime we we're going to use uh you know i mentioned that trade-off earlier about there's interpreters just in time compilers and then like sort of ahead of time compilers like so there are different VM implementations that use like one or many of those different approaches and like what's the right approach for red panda and kind of settling on figuring that out was, I think, one initial challenge. And like, they also have different feature sets, right? Some VMs only support like uh, WebAssembly is sort of a, uh, a, it has a core specification and a bunch of like additional proposals that are actively being merged into that core specification. For example, there's a uh, specification for like garbage collection that's coming through so that the, the VM itself can do garbage collection. That will mean that you can run things like Java and these other sorts of like, GC based languages within uh, the VM without having to like within the VM do garbage collection on top of the stuff already in the VM. It's a little just a more efficient. Um, so like figuring out like, like the support matrix of like what features it has and, and you know what use cases we need. So like that was I think the initial one. There's just a large design space there, right? Um, so like picking in where you can throw those. We eventually weeded through and got like the right one that works and also one that like works within the broker, right? It needs to have all the controls so we can do all these fancy things I talked about. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think there's one other thing, which is just like the resource model. We talked a lot about, you know, sort of, you know, this executable memory usage, the data memory usage for the VM itself, and then like getting this sort of like yielding control and things like all of those things were like, I think more like technical hard things, not like design hard things of like, you know, getting that actually working correctly and robustly within our like high performance environment, um, has been a challenge for sure. Um, but yeah, I'm, yeah. So I think those have been the two biggest ones, I would say. So Peter has one question. I think it kind of, uh, I think it's similar to what, what you're kind of related to what you're saying. So Red Panda uh, Transfer Feature is announced some time ago. Um, it's finally looking close to production, um, but it, there was a, there's a dark launch at some point before, because we've been saying that we're doing Watson for a very long time. Can you go into details of why this is? I think it also, I think it's relating to what you're saying right now, right? So we want to share. Well, yeah, yeah. So I think um, 
one, this was all sort of behind, but before my time at Red Panda, for the most part, was the previous incarnation of Wasm. So I'm sort of speaking secondhand, um, just to give that caveat. But my understanding is there's a few things. One, in that web WebAssembly, the, the ecosystem was still maturing a lot. And, and I mean, still is to someday, but it's a lot more mature than it was then. So um, the VM implementation is, the, the VM implementations are good enough that we can plug them into Red Panda um, appropriately. Whereas beforehand, what we were doing is we were running a sort of sidecar separate process on the same node as the broker. Um, like we were running V8 essentially is my understanding. So there's extra just, um, I think like maintenance things. Like one of our core tenants is like your single binary, you can deploy it easily anywhere, right? And like, as soon as you have, oh, but there's now this extra like Wasm sidecar thing that runs, right? So we weren't super happy about that. We were also still like I think rounding out the developer experience we learned a lot of things about just how, what's the programming model we expose to people do we need it like we learned we do need an SDK to like wrap all the sort of like networking and all the sort of like uh, other details there around like how records come in and out because ultimately you just have a record that you want to transform and put out like you don't really care the details of like the exact format that we do that um, so I think we we learned a lot of things from those previous incarnations but we also weren't feeling confident enough about them to really like, you know, have them be full, fully like supported and in that. But um, I think we've learned from that and we're getting, getting and ready. I, to do that I think also it's maturity of how Wasm has already come now. Oh, so for sure. It's, it's now ready more in a production ready states. Right. So that's why we're kind of happy with like, why we're doing this and why we're launching this for more production ready. And we'll, and we'd love to hear your feedback as well. Right. Cause you, you're working with it. Let us know your developer experience and kind of give us some, why did you like this? Any anything you want to see improvements on? Just let us know on our Slack um, channel. There's a Wasm. There's Wasm channel. There's other like, feature channels that you can talk about. You can talk about in our Red Panda channel. Whatever. Just let us know. And one last question. Um, I know we're running out of time already. And and I have one thing um, for you, Tyler. Make sure we're picking one a winner for the question I asked today. So you gotta pick one today. Or oh. uh, it's it's going to be hard because everybody oh. asks great questions. Um, so you can do that. But one last question for you, like, um, what do you, where do you see us go, going forward with Wasm? I mean, um, anything on top of your mind right now? Yeah, so yeah. I think going forward, there's obviously addressing those like immediate sort of limitations we talked about, um, which is, which is, you know, like some of the restrictions around one output topic and things like that. And then the other, but what I, what I'm looking forward to and excited is there's other places you can sort of plug in. Wasm becomes really like a plugin system for extending how the broker behaves. So you can see lots of other applications for doing cool things here. Like an immediate thing that kind of comes to mind is like authorization. So if you have like custom authorization you want to do at your big company, you can, you, you know, we maybe we provide like a, a Wasm engine to like do those sorts of things. There's already a project that sort of does some things like this. It's called Open Policy Agent. It's really cool. Um, but that's sort of like stuff that's exciting to me. There's also other things we've talked about around like changing our compaction logic that works for compacted topics, or you can think about also altering requests as they come in or come out. So like, as you know, you're writing data into the, cause right now, as you, if you want to transform a message, it has to be written to an output top input topic, and then we'll transform it and write it to an output topic. Right. But you may say, I just want to do validation before stuff even comes in. And if I get invalid JSON, I just want to like kick it out or whatever, you know, invalid requests. I just want to like reject completely. Right. So like we see that for like stronger payload validation or other things coming on the request path and also on the, read path there's also a lot of like really interesting cool like dynamic filtering or um stuff that we could do with wasm in the future that would be fun that i'm looking forward to as well that's perfect i'm also looking forward to it too sure. so thank you everybody for joining this month's uh, office hour happy to see you and i'll hope to see you next month all right thank you all